Antietam, the deadliest one-day battle in American military history, showed that the Union could stand up against the Confederate Army in the Eastern Theater. It also gave President Abraham Lincoln the confidence to issue the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation at a moment of strength rather than desperation. General Robert E. Lee committed his entire force to the battle, while Major General George B. McClellan sent in less than three quarters of his, with the full commitment of McClellan's troops, with which outnumbered the Confederates two to one, the battle might have been a more definitive outcome. Instead, McClellan's half-hearted approach allowed Lee to hold ground by shifting forces from threat to threat. Lee invaded Maryland in September of 1862 with a full agenda. He wanted to move the focus of fighting away from the South and into federal territory. Victories there could lead to the capture of the federal capital in Washington, D.C. Confederate success could also influence impending congressional elections in the North and persuade European nations to recognize the Confederate States of America. On the other side, President Abraham Lincoln was counting on McClellan to bring him the victory he needed to keep Republican control of the Congress and issue the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. Goodreads.com lists 34 books that have covered the Battle of Antietam. It is one of the most studied and written about battles of the war. I can only wish I had the free time to read more of these books. Time coupled with a very short attention span simply does not make it possible. However, one thing I have found that provides a tremendous source for these battles is to read the after-action reports. They're short, packed with first-hand accounts, and usually very detailed. Perfect for a reader like me. So, with that being said, I present to you my latest series, The Battlefield Reports, Part 1, General George Meade's Account of the Battle of Antietam. Headquarters, 3rd Division, September 22, 1862. Major Joseph Dickinson, Assistant Adjunct General. Major, I have the honor to submit herewith a report of the operations of the division under my command and the actions of the 16th and 17th instant on the Antietam. The division left the Mountain Gap on the morning of the 15th and marched beyond Ketisville, bivouacking on the forks of the Big and Little Antietam. On the afternoon of the 16th, about 2 p.m., the division, constituting the advance of Hooker's Corps, moved by the direction of the general commanding the Corps on the road to Williamsport, where, after crossing the bridge over the main Antietam, the head of the column was moved to the left across the country, advancing on what was understood to be the enemy's left flank. Soon after leaving the road, the cavalry advanced, reporting having been fired upon when, by the direction of the general commanding the Corps, the regiment of the 1st Pennsylvania Rifles was advanced as skirmishers to a piece of woods on our left, and four companies of the 3rd Regiment of Pennsylvania Reserves were deployed as skirmishers and sent into a piece of woods on our right. The main column formed of battalions in mass, division front, with the artillery moving over the open ground for a high ridge in front. The Bucktail skirmishers finding the enemy, General Seymour with the 1st Brigade was directed to advance to their support. This was promptly done, and soon Seymour was closely engaged with the enemy's infantry and artillery, Cooper's battery being posted by Seymour to reply to the enemy's artillery. In the meantime, I had gained the crest with the head of the column and entered a piece of woods which proved to be in its direction perpendicular to the line along which Seymour had advanced. On entering these woods, the enemy's battery could be plainly seen in a cornfield playing on Seymour's column in their front. The masses of his infantry deployed around the battery, and the fact that only one regiment, the head of my column, was deployed deterred me from the endeavor to capture the battery by a charge. I, however, immediately ordered by Ransom's battery of light 12 pounders, who promptly came to the front and in battery at the edge of the woods, opening on the enemy's battery and infantry a destructive inflating fire, which soon caused him to withdraw his guns to an eminence in the rear, from which he commenced shelling the woods we occupied and the ridge immediately behind it. In the meantime, Magleton's and Anderson's brigades came up and were deployed in line of battle to support Ransom's battery. 
After driving the enemy from the woods, Seymour held his own, and, darkness intervening, the contest closed for the night, Seymour holding the woods immediately in front of the enemy, and Anderson and Magloton the woods on their flank. Ransom was withdrawn to the rear. Cooper remained in the position occupied in the commencement of the action, and Simpson's battery of howitzers, which had been posted on the edge of the ridge of the rear, replying to the enemy's battery in its second position, also remained there. During the night, the enemy made two attacks on Seymour's pickets, in both which he was repulsed with, it is believed, severe losses. On early daylight on the 17th, the contest was warmly renewed by Seymour, the enemy attacking with vigor. The general commanding the corps had sent Ricketts Division to Seymour's support and had advanced Doubleday's division along the woods occupied by Magleton's and Anderson's brigade. These brigades were formed in column of battalions in mass and were moved forward in rear of Doubleday. Seymour and Ricketts advancing through one piece of woods and Doubleday on their right advancing along the Hagerstown Pike left an open space in which was a plowed field and an orchard. Beyond this was a cornfield, the possession of which the enemy warmly disputed. Ransom's battery has, had advanced into the open ground between the two advancing columns and played with great effect on the enemy's infantry and batteries. The brigades of Anderson and Magleton on reaching the cornfield were massed in a ravine extending up the pike. Soon after forming, I saw the enemy were driving our men from the cornfield. I immediately deployed both brigades and formed line of battle along the fence, bordering the cornfield for the purpose of covering the withdrawal of our people and resisting farther advance of the enemy. Just as the line of battle was formed, I received an order from the general commanding the corps to detach a brigade to reinforce our troops in the woods on the left. I directed Magleton's brigade to move in that direction, which order was promptly executed, notwithstanding the brigade, moving by the flank, was subjected to a warm fire from the cornfield. Anderson's brigade held the fence on the right, but the gap made by the withdrawal of Magleton was soon filled by the enemy, whose infantry advanced boldly through the cornfield to the woods. Seeing this, I rode up to Ransom's battery and directed his guns on their advancing column, which fire, together with the arrival of Magneton's brigade, in connection with Seymour and Ricketts, drove the enemy back, who, as they retreated, were enfiladed by Anderson, who eventually regained the crest of the ridge in the cornfield. At this time, at about 10 a.m., my division had been engaged for five hours and their ammunition was being exhausted. I therefore welcomed the arrival of Banks Corps, the left column of which, commanded by gallant Mansfield, moved up to their support in the woods on the left, and a column under General Williams moved up to the woods on the right by the turnpike. I should have mentioned previously that the 10th Regiment, Lieutenant Colonel Warner, was detached across the pike to watch our right flank, and was eventually, I believe, put in action by General Gibbon, rendering, rendering good service in that part of the field. Also, that Cooper's battery of three-inch guns and Simpson's howitzers were early in the morning posted on the crest of the ridge we occupied the evening previous, from whence they had a command of the enemy's left flank and were in action at various times during the day, opening whenever they saw any of the enemy's artillery or infantry and doing good service in protecting our hospital and trains in the rear. Between 11 and 12 a.m., Mansfield's Corps, having reached the scene of the action, also Sumner's, the Corps had the misfortune to lose the service of its skillful and brave commander, who was wounded in the foot, and who did me the honor to direct me to assume the command of the Corps on his leaving the field. I directed the various divisions to be withdrawn as soon as they were relieved, and to be assembled and reorganized on the ridge in our rear. By 2 p.m., the Division of the Pennsylvania Reserves, now commanded by General Seymour, were organized on this ridge, supplied with ammunition, and held in readiness to repel an attack if the enemy should attempt one on our right flank and insist in any advance we might make. I beg leave to refer to the reports of the several brigade and regimental commanders for the details of the operation. I desire particularly, however, to call your attention to the report of Brigadier General Seymour, 
because from the confidence I placed in the judgment and military skill of that officer, I left entirely to him the management and direction of his brigade, the first in action and the only one engaged with the infantry on the afternoon of the 16th and the first to commence and the last to leave on the 17th. I desire to commend most particularly to your notice the gallantry and good conduct of this officer, which I have no doubt you observed yourself. I feel it also due to the memory of a gallant soldier and accomplished gentleman to express here my sense of the loss to the public service in the fall of Colonel Hugh McNeil of the 1st Pennsylvania Rifles, who fell mortally wounded while in the front, bravely leading on and encouraging his men on the afternoon of the 16th. Many other brave and gallant soldiers were killed and wounded. For those whose names I refer you to the company list, the division went into action under 3,000 strong and lost in killed and wounded over 570, 20%. The conduct throughout the action, both of the officers and men, was such as to merit my warmest thanks and to truly entitle them to the name of veterans. To my personal staff, consisting of Captain E.C. Baird, Assistant Adjunct General, and Lieutenants William Riddle and A.G. Mason, aides, I am indebted as to here before for the prompt execution of my orders under the severest fire. Lieutenant Riddle received a painful wound in the hand just before the division was withdrawn from the field. I cannot close this report without calling your attention to the skill and good judgment combined with coolness with which Captain Ransom, his officers, and men served his battery. In a previous part of this report, I have described the advance of the enemy throughout the cornfield and the check the column received from Captain Ransom's fire. I consider this one of the most crucial periods of the morning and that to Captain Ransom's battery is due the credit of repulsing the enemy. I also wish to mention particularly the, the efficiency and gallantry of Lieutenant Colonel Warner, 10th Pennsylvania Reserves, both in the actions of South Mountain and on Antietam. He was detached with his regiment for special service, accomplished by him in the most credible manner, and in the latter battle he was severely wounded. He is an officer whom I would be glad to see elevated to a higher position. Surgeon William King, the medical director of the division, was early on the field in both actions, and with his usual energy and promptitude brought up the ambulances and established the hospitals in such a manner as to secure for our wounded the speediest assistance. There are many other names that will be brought to your notice through the reports of subordinate commanders, as I have confined myself in this report exclusively to those that came under my special notice. Very respectably, your obedient servant, George G. Meade, Brigadier General, Commanding. <laughs>